Okay, thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to present some of this work um, that we have done. So this will be about ontologies for representing and integrating phenotypes. And when we look at biology, then we see a change in the way that we understand and uh, collect data. And this is uh, due to the emergence of high throughput technologies in almost all areas of biology. And in particular, so this talk will be related to the application of high throughput technologies uh, for phenotype experiments. And phenotype experiments, such as now underway, for example, for mice in the International Knockout Mouse Consortium, um, model organisms are genetically modified, and the outcome, um, then they are grown, and the outcome is recorded. Uh, and the phenotype is observed, so there are test batteries um, and sets of tests that these organisms undergo, and then in the standardized, standardized assays, um, the outcome is recorded in the hope that we can learn something about um, the genotype to or phenotype relation by this, and eventually maybe find causal mutations that are responsible for human diseases. And well, these efforts, for example, for the IKMC, there's a part which has been done in Japan, uh, another part is done in UK, another part in the US, and we are faced with something like, like this. So um, this is the well-known uh, well, confusion. We have different pieces of data, sort of different databases uh, by different people and so on. And one means to characterize some aspects of what these data, uh, what these pieces of data in different formats and so on by uh, different groups have in common is um, to use ontologies and ontologies whoops uh, okay I seem to face similar problems um, so this was supposed to be greener and uh, okay but uh, maybe we see a little bit but uh, ontologies are used to integrate aspects of data and characterize um, the meaning of some aspect of them. Um, and they can integrate data in at least three dimensions. And the first dimension is across domains and levels of granularity. So from a molecular scale, we have different ontologies there pertaining to different uh, to molecules, genes, and so on, all the way up to organs, bodies, populations. The second dimension is a classical ontological, uh, our classical ontological distinctions. Um, and they uh, represent different ways, different aspects, or different ways that we collect data, different aspects um, about uh, things that we want to describe. So physical objects, they may have mass and so on. Uh, they are located in space and time. They are described differently than the qualities that these physical objects have. Qualities may not have a mass, qualities, masses are qualities, and so on. And they are different, again, from the functions or capabilities to which physical objects and qualities give rise and to the, from the processes uh, which are the manifestations of this. Now, the third dimension would be somewhere here. It is the set axis. It's uh, the integration across different species. But uh, merely using ontologies um, does not reduce heterogeneity. It just uh, raises heterogeneity problems to a higher level. And instead uh, of facing the problem of integrating the data across different databases, we are now faced with the problem of having a large number, there are more than 200 or something in the bioportal, a large number of biomedical ontologies um, and relate them together. And especially for phenotypes, so these are ontologies which are actively being used by different communities for the description of phenotypes. So there are anatomy ontologies in different species. Uh, there are specific phenotype ontologies, again, for different species. Uh, ontologies of qualities. Then there are ontologies such as the gene ontology and uh, function ontologies, physiology ontologies, other resources like mappings and so on. Um, so when we look at one example, so this is a disease. It's called Tetralogy of Fellow. It's a, a heart disease. It's a heritable one. It's characterized by four, phenot uh, four phenotypes. It's the overwriting aorta, the pulmonic stenosis, ventricular septal defect, and the right ventricular hyper hypertrophy. Um, and these, we can find this in a database such as OMEM, uh, these phenotypes, and they're characterized in human terms. 
Now, when we look at, for example, one of the mouse models which comes out of this IKMC effort, this International Knockout Mouse Consortium effort, so this is a knockout for the PHC1 gene in mice, and these are some of them, so these are just some aspects of the, of the mouse model, some of the phenotypes, and we can see there, are some, there seems to be some overlap, at least judging from the names, it's overwriting our order, we have the ventricular septal defect and so on. But all of these are characterized in terms of uh, mouse phenotypes. So formally they have nothing in common, but they're labeled. Now there's a little bit more, and it's a uh, bit hidden in this paper by uh, George Gutos. So there's a way, an entity quality way of describing phenotypes based on the entity which is affected in such a phenotype. Maybe an anatomical structure, but it may also be a function, it may also be a process and the quality which says how this entity is affected. So we have um, whole organism attributes and so on, so an increased size, anatomical parts may be missing or pre extra parts may be present, there may be functions and dysfunctions, and there may be processes which have extended durations, they may have uh, frequencies and so on. And based on these different patterns, uh, we have to combine these ontologies, this large set of ontologies which are related to phenotypes um, in different ways and um, now again this is, has to be hidden, uh, I try not to go over these 10 minutes so it has to be a little bit hidden but what we have done is we have come up with these four patterns, formalized these phenotype ontologies at the anatomy ontologies combined many of them and derived one big cross species phenotype ontology which integrates them all for six species at least for yeast, fly, worm, fish, mouse and human phenotypes. And this is based on OWL, so there are no individuals, so no instances, there's no uh, direct use of RDF. And the reason that we used OWL is because we are interested in the property chains. We want to combine ad hoc and we want to infer something about combinations of properties, of relations between, uh, between uh, individuals. Well, and we uh, rely on complex axiom patterns. And the result of this uh, it's uh, actually quite big. So this is an ontology which has 300,000 classes, a million axioms, even more than this. And um, it will not even open in Protégé, even if you give it something like 24 gigabytes of memory. So you cannot really look at it, uh, but uh, we have developed a tool which you can use um, and can have a look at. And with this, what we get is, so this is uh, the tetralogy of a low example, and the reason this is for human, and this is for mouse, and there are more, it's a bit long, and it comes, uh, this is the omen description of this disease, so it's omen 187500, and we took uh, the phenotypes that omen characterizes for human here, um, inferred all the superclasses, uh, so this is why these are very, very many. Um, well, and then translated this um, in this phenotype ontology to mouse and to all the other species as well. And based on this, what we then could do, we could uh, compare these phenotypes since they are integrated in one common ontology. So basically there's one language instead of six languages. We have bridged this species gap with this ontology and this allow and bridging this, bridging this, uh, species gap allows us to directly compare these phenotypes. So this is something that we could not get uh, just by having these different vocabularies individually. By linking them, we get the means, we have one way to describe these phenotypes in six different species, and this gives us the possibility to directly compare them. And then we applied some form of semantic similarity, which is basically just set overlap. Um, in, in this case, there may be some, some better results. So it's basically set comparison, the Jacquard index weighted by information content. Well, and then we get a similarity matrix, and there's another cool feature. So um, this gives us the possibility to evaluate what we have done based on predicting known um, orthologue genes, known orthologue uh, genes which participate in a pathway, also across species, and maybe even known uh, gene disease associations. And when we look at this, we can draw rock curves it's not really a rock curve, uh, so this is a true positive rate versus false positive rate. It's this plot, uh, it's called a rock curve. Um, and we can do this for disease, orthology, and pathway. The random line, so this would be a random classifier here. 
So it's not perfect, but since it's only by looking at these things, just by comparing phenotypes, um, we get something, an um, area under the curve for predicting diseases of something like 0 0.85. Um, now with the latest version of this. So it's uh, kind of nice, um, the best systems for predicting um, disease gene candidates get something like 0 0.91 but they use um, a lot of other information such as uh, gene ontology. So um, in summary, um, just, linking this, uh, just linking the data, um, uh, just linking the data is not always sufficient for integrating. So sometimes what we want is more expressive rules, constraints, which allow us to construct additional knowledge which gives us the means to infer something that we would not be able just by creating some links. And for this we have used OWL, it adds some, something on top of RDF, uh, model theoretic semantics, property chains, definition patterns and so on. Supports automated reasoning um, and consistency verification. Well, and what we have done here, and this is something which is not very common, is uh, that we could quantitatively evaluate um, how well we have designed this ontology because there was a scientific use case. In the end, something we did not only integrate the data and uh, there are probably about five papers and five different methods of combining these ontologies, phenotype ontologies across species. Probably there are more than this. Um, but neither of them ever actually put this to a test and said, well, okay, so there, there are many arguments about philosophy there, but nobody actually tested what gives best results. So um, when you look at this, I mean, there may be other people who will do it better and uh, hopefully they will also show the result on, at least for this task. Um, here, this gave us a means for evaluation, which is something which I think is very important also for data integration. Um, Okay, so this is, many people have contributed to this, um, especially George um, and um, Michael Eschburner, but also Michelle and Dietrich. Um, so, yeah, thank you. <laughs>